Hello, this is Dr. Trevor. Today, let's talk about Gauss's law for spherically symmetric charge distributions. So the idea of this lesson is to help you set up integrations and determine the electric field caused by a spherically symmetric charge distribution. Now, what we mean by spherically, spher, yeah, spherically symmetric charge distribution, go ahead and try to say that a few times fast. Um, in this type of a situation, you've got a amount of charge that's spread out in a uh, dimension such that if I go in the theta direction, if I go in the phi direction, uh, things don't change. But if I go out in the r direction, it could change. So a ball would be a perfect example of spherically symmetric. Um, a ball that has a coating of paint on it would also work that way. In certain layers, you're going to have paint. Certain distances away from the center, you're not going to have paint. Okay, so to, in order to understand this, you really need to have a feel for spherical polar coordinates. This is going to be a very quick review of that. Um, if you've seen this before, I apologize. If you haven't seen it before, um, take a look around. You can find out all kinds of information about this uh, in various places. Okay, now you're used to elements. You've never probably called them that before, but whenever you talk about dx or dy, those are the elements in... Uh, X and Y coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. In spherical polar coordinates, we have a different set of line elements and they change depending on your dimension, whether you're going uh, R, Phi, or Theta, um, because of the way those uh, terms interact. So let's take a quick look at them. The line element starts out with R, DR, or excuse me, dr r hat okay if i'm moving in this r hat direction the only thing that changes is dr so if i move out i just move in small increments of dr that has no effect on where i'm at anywhere on the sphere as long as i'm just going out i'm only changing dr in the theta direction theta being down along uh these would be north-south lines uh, on a globe. In that case, how far I travel depends on how far away I am from the center. So if you see over here, this bit, if I were moving way in closer, that line would be shorter. So I have to put in the r d theta for it. In the third dimension, the phi dimension, things get a little bit more complicated because in this case, how far away I am from the central axis uh, is going to have a big effect. As I swing around this curve at this level, um, I use r sine theta, d theta. If I were down at the axis here, theta is going to be bigger, the sine theta is going to be bigger, and I'm going to see a bigger sweep down there. Now, if we take each of these elements and we start to put them together, we can make out the area element and the volume element. The area element depends on all three pieces, and I've got them color-coded here. Notice that if I'm looking at this yellow area, that there's no specific R. I'm not changing the distance I am away from the origin. However, the R does show up because as I sweep down in this direction and then I sweep in the other direction, I get a mix of all three pieces here. So these are R d theta, R sine theta, and d theta. Now, most times we rewrite these so that we've got R squared sine theta, d theta, d phi. If I'm going to do an integration over this, I'm going to have to do it over all three of the dimensions. Now, the volume element is also useful. In this case, we often use the letter tau rather than a V because we often apply them in situations involving electricity, and we don't want to mess up the W, or excuse me, the, the V with the... Uh, for volume with the V for potential. So we often use the tau for the volume element. Okay, in this case, notice that 
all I need to do is take this area and sweep it in the R direction now to get a volume. So I pick up this extra R squared out front. Excuse me, not the extra R squared. I pick up the DR that's showing up there. Okay, so the volume element and the area element are almost exactly the same except for the DR bit. Okay, now the reason this is important is because whenever you look at Gauss's law, on the left-hand side, you've got this area. You're going to integrate over the whole area. It would be helpful if you can set this up as an area elements and work your way through those. On the other side of the equation, in order to figure out what the charge enclosed is, one of the ways you can find it is know what the charge density is at each point and then integrate that over the volume. If it's spherically symmetric, the volume element that we're going to put in is going to be the spherically symmetric setup for that. Okay, and that's how you find the amount of charge. Now, when we put these two together, we end up with an integral on the left and an integral on the, white, on the right. Let's take a look at how this works. Each side has the area element, and we want to make sure that we use the proper element on each side. Okay, now let's use a sphere of charge, and in this particular sphere of charge, the charges are embedded in an insulator that keeps them apart and allows us to move them throughout the volume. The distribution is going to get more dense as you move away from the center. And we've got the charge density following the formula. The rho of R is equal to CR. So the further I get out, it goes up linearly on how much charge I have. C in this case is just a constant. Okay, and we want to figure out what the field is inside the charge distribution. So what we're going to do is use that charge density. We're going to use Gauss's law. We're going to use that formula to figure out how that charge is arranged. And we're going to put those two together so we've got the left-hand side and the right-hand side to take a look at. Okay, the area element, excuse me, the volume element shows up on the right hand side. So as we work our way through this, notice that I threw in the uh, element over here. Since I went from one variable to really three variables, I've put got a triple integral on this side. On the left hand side, just to save myself some steps, I also applied the fact that DE, or excuse me, E and DA are perpendicular. The field here is going to point symmetrically away along the R axis, or along the R direction, should I say. And the area element is also going to point in that direction. So I throw in cosine of zero. Now, if I put that area element in on the left-hand side, notice here that the E is now a constant as long as I stay on this sphere. Now, in actuality, I pointed to the outside, but I'm staying inside this, this dimension. So I'm looking here at R1, at any particular R along this. Now I'm not going to throw in a particular R1 because I don't care exactly where that's at. It could be anywhere as long as I'm still inside. Okay, so my cosine of zero is one. That's where that comes from. I've popped in my area element. I've pulled the E outside because it's a constant. On the right hand side, I have taken this step and now I'm going to integrate over my R bits, over my theta bits, and over my phi bits. Notice that my limit, limits of integration go from 0 to R, wherever R happens to be in here. I go all the way from the top of the sphere to the bottom of the sphere. That is uh, from 0 to pi in the theta direction. And I'm going to go all the way around the sphere, so all the way around the equator, for example. And that is going to be uh, from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, because I'm staying at a fixed uh, distance away from the center, my r's are constant. So I pull those out, so I've got a factor of r squared on this side. 
and I've got my limits of integration put in very similar to like I did on the right hand side. Okay, and I didn't do much on the left hand side here, but notice now I've got the same integral on the left and the right side, except, you know, at least parts of the integrals are the same. So I could evaluate those. In reality, I'm just going to allow them to cancel out. That could be a little bit dangerous if my limits of integration were different or if the elements were different. Okay, when I do cross those out, I'm left with a much simpler looking integration here. I've got e r squared on the left hand side, that's equal to one over epsilon naught times that constant and the integral from zero to r of r cubed dr. If I evaluate that integral, I've got a couple of pieces going on here. I've got one over epsilon naught c times that integral evaluates to 1 over 4, uh, r to the fourth, and I have to integrate it from 0 to r. And in the second step here, you can see that's exactly what I did. I throw in my r's, so I get r to the four, 1 quarter r to the fourth minus 1 fourth times 0. That simplifies down a little bit. And in this last step, I did ten, kind of two steps at the same time. I had an r squared on this side. I had the r fourth r to the fourth on this side. Two of those cancel out, leaving me with r squared. And I've got my four from the one quarter, and I've got c riding along, and I've got my epsilon uh, riding along as well. So notice what happens here. As I move out, the electric field goes up as a square. Now this is only valid until I get to capital R, but I'm anywhere below that, which is why I didn't throw in the capital R for the radius of my uh, spherical charge distribution. Okay, this is exactly the same problem, except I'm going to do it from the outside. So I'm gonna skip through some of the steps here a little more quickly. Okay, so everything so far is the same as we just did. Except now I'm going to put in my limits of integration and I have to stop integrating the charge once I reach the outside of the charge distribution. Okay, I can't keep going out here because there's no charge out here. The left hand side remains exactly the same. Again, I've got my uh, area integration, my area integration on the other side. Those guys just cancel out with each other. It's the same integral, except this time my limits of integration are different. I go from zero to capital R, and I get this new integration out on the other side. So just uh, for anybody that's listening at home, uh, and not watching the video, you can see this, is, uh, we now have e r squared is equal to one over epsilon naught times c times the quantity one over four r to the fourth minus one over four times zero. Okay, if we take that through again, notice that my r's don't cancel this time because I've got a capital R for the radius of the distribution and I've got a lowercase r for the position that I'm investigating. Okay, so now my field is E is equal to the fraction C over four pi or four epsilon naught times the fraction R to the fourth over R squared. Okay, so just as a quick review, Gauss's law allows us to determine the field caused by spherically symmetric charge distributions. Uh, we can use Gauss's law and this equation to figure out the uh, amount of charge that's enclosed. When we put those two together, we've got integrations on both sides, one over the area, one over the volume. When you apply these, make sure that you set your limits of integration uh, at the proper locations. You don't want to integrate past the outer edge of your charge. Okay, you'll see lots of different problems like this where the th a value of rho changes, this function will change, just make sure that you follow 
uh, the proper rules for integration when you apply those. Okay, so good luck. Hopefully this helped and we'll see you on the other side.